Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Hodson, and I work with the Arizona Region of USA Volleyball. This is our third and final uh, webinar in conjunction with the uh, Arizona Interscholastic Association. Again, I want to thank uh, the Executive Director David Hines and his assistant Taylor Cody for their help and their guidelines in putting this together for the uh, high school coaches of uh, Arizona. Uh, I also want to mention that we work with the Arizona Region of USA Volleyball and under the chat button um, on your dashboard uh, is my emails. And if you have questions, feedback, uh, anything that you might need help with going forward, uh, please don't hesitate to email me. Uh, I'm honored tonight to introduce Mike Wall. He has been an assistant coach with the US men's national team since 2013. Before that, Mike worked with Arizona State University, the University of Utah and St. Mary's College as an assistant coach after his playing days were over at BYU where his teams won two national championships and he was a first team All-American both those seasons. He enjoyed a professional career as well in Switzerland and Puerto Rico, as well as a stint on the men's national team. Mike is also the director of Gold Medal Squared Volleyball, which has had a substantial impact in both coaching education in the United States and beyond, and has been led to a lot of success with both the US men's and women's national teams. Uh, we couldn't be more happy to have Mike join us tonight. And Mike, thank you very much for, uh, for doing this. Thanks, Eric, and uh, thanks for having me on tonight. It's always uh, humbling and uh, to talk Molly and uh, have other folks, uh, especially here in Arizona, uh, join in on the conversation and uh, as we can all kind of hone our craft and learn and uh, get better at what we do as we go. So uh, to all the folks that are on here with us, thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, investing in your your craft and uh, and trying to get a little a little bit better for your kids and so that's what it's all about so I appreciate it and uh, we're on the clock we've got quite a bit to cover here and not so much time so we're gonna just dive right in um, the this presentation is a little bit academic <clears throat> but we are going to uh, or I'm gonna do my best to uh, put it into context and, and simplify it for you uh, long story short the goal here is to uh, give you some ideas on how you can be a more effective to be a more effective teacher for your for your athletes how can we simplify things um, how can we increase the rate at which they learn uh, that's the general gist of this uh, presentation and so uh, we'll go through it here I'll give you also some material at the end a couple links with more uh, resources and a, a PDF file for you to download and take with you as a <clears throat> some additional information to to go over it's too much to to cover here uh, within the hour and so anyhow we're diving in um motor learning uh we're gonna we're gonna just talk about um some of the general principles but but as a starting point uh we just should state state the coaching is really complex uh, there's so many things that we have to do as coaches, and this is relative. I, I firmly believe that it's relative whether you're a, a junior high coach, whether you're a, a JV coach, a prof coach, a varsity coach, or a national team coach. All of those positions uh, require lots of decision making. Uh, we have to be good at a number of diverse skills. And as you know, you have to make thousands of decisions. You know, you got to figure out systems. You got to uh, work on mechanics and you got to manage relationships and you have to manage parents and travel and, and everything else that comes with the job. And so, uh, so much of it, unfortunately, has become um, outside of the volleyball gym. But if we just want to focus on inside of the volleyball gym, there's still an enormous amount that goes into it. And so knowing that it's important that we have, um, I don't know, some some big rocks or some some uh, key points to focus on to simplify your efforts. So we're going to dive into that here. Uh, we want to make things as simple as possible in an effort to keep us focused as coaches. Uh, the five major coaching decisions that that we like to focus on. I don't know this is this is not all of them, but these are the major ones that we like. Are uh, fundamentals. We're big on mechanics. We think that uh, being or developing mechanically sound, fundamentally sound athletes, ultimately will help them down the line. Uh, It'll make coaches that, that coach those athletes after you. It'll make their lives easier. It'll uh, increase the odds of them being successful, uh, particularly an athlete that may not be uh, as gifted as others. Uh, their rate of learning can increase and they can kind of catch up. 
And so I, I believe that I like to say that good fundamentals will score you points and crummy fundamentals will cost you points. And, and when you look at it that way, uh, it, it tends to, to focus pretty well. And so if you want to score a few more points a game, mechanics can help you. Good, good fundamentals can help you do that. Uh, we got to worry about systems, tactics, players. And so perhaps you've heard the saying, um, put your, or one of the principles we have is put your best players uh, where lots of the balls go or building systems around the abilities of your players. And so, you know, team systems, are we in a 6-2? Uh, are we going to run a 6-5-1? Uh, um, tactics, are we going to have any blocking tactics? And so there's all of these uh, decisions uh, based on the players that are in your gym uh, that we have to make uh, as it relates to the team and tactics. Motivation, which can be exhausting. We have to figure out how to write practices that are motivating, that are energetic. Uh, we have to figure out how to motivate the, uh, the collective group. We have to figure out how to motivate individual athletes. So we're going to dive into that, to that a little bit. Uh, we have to have good drills. And we know coaches love drills. Uh, we're going to try to talk you into the idea of having a handful of drills that you love and that your athletes love and that you're really, really good at running. And one of my sayings is uh, we don't want to be drill runners. We want to be teachers. And so uh, I think a question that I always ask is next time you go into the gym, check yourself a little bit. And are you a drill runner or are you teaching? Are you actively engaged in teaching and helping your athletes get better? And so we've all fallen into that trap. I certainly have. Um, but the drills we run are important. But we at the same time, we don't need 5,000 of them. And we don't need to be trying new drills out every day because it just takes time and, and disrupts the flow of practice um, rather than having your favorite drills, your athletes' favorite drills, and you're really, really good at running them. Perhaps, I don't know, you could argue this is the most important thing, especially if you're a club coach uh, or a high school coach. How much practice time do you get every week? Are you competing with basketball? If you're in a club, uh, you probably only get four to, four to six hours a week, probably four hours a week. And so you have to ask yourself, okay, if I have four hours, what am I going to do today that's going to give me a little bit of an advantage? How am I going to write better practices or run better drills or um, teach the fundamentals better within that four-hour window to where perhaps um, a team that's maybe less talented can catch up a little bit to a team that might be a little more talented? And so time is limited, and how we use that time is critical. We like to say there are no little things. Uh, volleyball is a fickle sport, incredibly fickle, and the margins are thin. And so I'm going to take you through a couple examples here. And this graphic is an illustration of the 2013 men's volleyball season in the MPSF, collegiate men's volleyball. And you'll see the order of finish. This is conference play. So BYU is at the top, UCI, that's Irvine, Long Beach State, UCLA, and so on. And you can see the win-loss. So BYU at the top of the conference was 21-3. and three, And they scored 52.9% of the total points that were available. And you can see, if we go down to UCI, they were 03 below BYU. So they scored 52.6% of the points, total points available. So a tiny difference there, yet their record was 18 and six. And so you can see here, as we go down this chart, that there's these tiny differences in points scored, the, the amount of points scored, really thin margin, but the difference in win losses is significant. And you can see that the difference between BYU and UC Santa Barbara, who is at the bottom, was 52.9 versus 50.1. Yet UCSB was 11 and 13, below 500. And so a uh, very small difference in terms of the points scored, but a very big difference in terms of their win-loss record. And so volleyball's fickle, and the margins are extremely thin, especially if you're competing for any type of a championship. We, along the same lines, we talk about the 2% rule. And Gil Fellingham is a statistician up at BYU, and he's a volunteer assistant for the women's program now. And he's done multiple studies for USA Volleyball and others. And he put this chart together uh, several years back. And, and essentially, 
uh, what he's trying to do is illustrate small improvements and what what a one percent improvement will yield you in terms of wins and losses what a two percent improvement will yield in, in terms of win, wins and losses and the top chart is a projection this is what he projected uh, based on his research and so you can see here the the very top row 50 50 we're assuming a 30 match season and it's not surprising that you know it if it's 50 50 then you're gonna uh, be 15 and 15 your win probability is going to be 15 you're going to lose 15. Uh, this is side out efficiency by the way i, I should have mentioned that um, and so here you have 50 51 percent 49 percent there's a two percent difference here and just this two percent difference in side out efficiency got the uh, projection up to 19 wins and 11 losses Okay, so the difference between, you know, we're pretty equal 50-50 here, 15 and 15. We just get 2% better and we're all the way up to 19 and 11. If we can get 4% better than our opponents, we're going to win 74% of our matches and all of a sudden our record jumps to 22 and 8 and so on. Um, if we get all the way down here and we end up 20% better than your opponent, you're going to win all your matches. And so the magic here is just that these tiny little margins, the difference between 51% and 49%, 2% um, in a 30 match season is substantial in terms of your win and loss probability. Now, we put this uh, projection to the test up at the University of Washington and turns out it was dead on. And so in 2002, the University of Washington was siding out at 61%. Opponents were at 59. They played 31 matches. And their probability was 20 and 11. So if that's 2% better, here we are. The probability that Gil, Gil discussed was 19 and 11. And so 20 and 11, pretty darn close. Now, if we get 4% better, so 2003, we're 4% better than our opponents, play 32 matches. The probability is 74%, which is exactly what Gil projected. And the record was uh, 24, or the projection was 24 and eight. The actual record is 23 and nine. So again, right on the money. And we go down this list. And in 2005, the University of Washington was 20% better than their opponents. Uh, their probability to win those matches was 99%. Uh, 33 and 0 was the uh, projected um, record, and they went 32 and 1. They won the national championship, and they lost to UCLA in five. That was the one loss there in year 2005. And so you can see little little increases, 1 percent, 2 percent, have a substantial impact in the sport of volleyball, and that's the point to take away from this. If you can get just a little bit better over the course of couple weeks, a month, two months as you work through your season and, and you keep that kind of mindset, your win probability will go up substantially. In 2016, we were in Rio de Janeiro for the Olympics. And uh, this is one of the most heartbreaking matches of my career. I don't know if any of you were watching it, but we played Italy in the semifinals for the right to play Brazil for the gold medal. And we had already beaten Brazil in pool play. Um, and we were up on Italy 21-18, I think, give or take, 21-18. And we were rolling. We were playing really, really good volleyball. And uh, Italy's best server goes back and just goes on this insane run. And uh, there were a couple of balls that, barely scraped the end line. They did the, the replay. We're talking millimeters. And uh, long story short, they had some magic and uh, came back and won uh, set four and we lost in five and had to play for the bronze. And so you can see here, uh, difference in side out efficiency between gold, silver, and bronze is right here. Brazil was at 71.7. Italy was at seven <coughs> seventy one. And uh, USA is at 770. And so 
Uh, it turns out that that 71 number, 72 number is very common amongst state or not state champions, uh, collegiate uh, national champions and uh, international champions. So margins are thin. So we've got to figure out what matters the most. And we've got mechanics, systems, tactics, motivation, drills, uh, time, and we've got to figure out uh, how to make these decisions. How do we choose these methods? And so what are methods? Where do you get your methods? And so a couple of quotes here that we really like. Second here. All right. As to methods, there may be a million and then some, but principles are few. The person who grasps principles can successfully select his or her own methods. The person who tries methods ignoring principles is sure to have trouble. And so you can see if you just Google, uh, I don't know, passing in volleyball, you're going to get a million different ideas. And, and this is kind of what we're talking about. The person who tries methods of ignoring principles is sure to have trouble. So we believe that if you have some guiding principles, it can really help you, uh, I don't know, sort through the fog and determine methods that are effective and efficient, especially given your lack of time. Uh, we love this quote, simple, clear principles give rise to complex and intelligent behavior. Complex rules and regulations give rise to simple and stupid behavior. So we're trying to simplify and we're trying to let uh, some principles guide us when we're trying to select methods, coaching methods. How do we want to train fundamentals? How do we want to train team systems? All that type of stuff. So principles, where do we get principles? And we, we like to talk about the laws of learning, as did John Wooden. And, uh, and principles can be discovered via research, science, uh, statistics, uh, there's all these different ways that we can gather our principles um, through experience. Uh, we've tried this thing a million different ways. It's worked well. It hasn't worked well. And so uh, that's where coaches get their principles. And certainly we hope that uh, in some of these educational events, you can pick up some principles there as well. But uh, I, would, I would like to note that principles, sometimes that word feels restrictive. Um, when you really wrap your head around a principle, it's very liberating and it can give you so many choices. And you know that when you're making choices that it's based on sound principles, it's, uh, I don't know, keeps you in line as a coach and it, it ensures that uh, when you do want to go experiment or you do want to try something new, that those decisions are backed by your core, core values or your core principles. All right, I'm going to uh, jump into another presentation here. We're going to keep rolling. Eric, I'm assuming, uh, are we full screen here? Can you see this? Yes, you're good, you're good to go. Yeah, and I just want to remind everybody really quick, don't forget if you have questions uh, on your um, task bar to the right or left, uh, just type, type the questions in and, I'll, and if they're relevant to what Mike's talking about, I'll make sure we get a master right away. Okay. So we talked about margins are thin. We talked about the 2% rule um, and just how important time is and, and kind of the, the five uh, big ideas that we want to tackle and just how we can be more efficient as coaches. And so when it comes to motor learning, there's three big ideas that, that we want to discuss that we hope will help you become a more efficient coach in the gym. So we're going to talk about goal presentation and uh, basically helping your players understand how to perform the skills of the game. How do we want to pass? How do we want to serve? What's the process for teaching that? Uh, motor program development, creating a practice environment that most effectively and efficiently perfects our volleyball skills. And so what type of drills or what type of feedback, all these types of things are going to make your time and your athletes time most effective, most efficient. We're going to talk about how we can increase feedback and reps. Turns out this is one of the most important things that you can do as a coach. And how do we want to provide this information to our athletes? It's really critical how we do that. So those are our three big motor learning ideas. And uh, we're going to dive right in here. Goal presentation. Learners have a limited ability to process information. If there's nothing else that you take away from this presentation, please remember that. 
uh, as a coach, we tend to talk way too much. It's not, I wouldn't even say it's kind of close. I, I think it's uh, some, <laughs> at times we just talk way too much. I've done it myself. Um, it's a trap that we fall into sometimes, but just remember that learners have a limited ability to process information. Learners can be coaches, they can be athletes, uh, but information overload and no one's learning, no one's listening, and, uh, and the, just the effectiveness of what we're doing decreases. And so we want to reduce information as much as possible when we're teaching athletes. Demonstrations. Uh, there's lots and lots of research, and it's getting stronger as we go, that really high quality demonstrations are incredibly effective. And I'll give you a link at the end of this presentation, but we did a, uh, an updated motor learning presentation um, a couple months back, and we talked about some of these ideas on how important good demonstrations are, and, and in some cases, more effective than talking to our athletes about certain things. And so at its most basic level, I have a three-year-old uh, little boy and a five-year-old daughter. And when we were, you know, full-time quarantine back in the spring, we were swimming every day just to get outside and to try to keep our heads on straight. And uh, when we started the quarantine, our son was in floaties. And about two weeks in, we, my wife and I decided, all right, we're just going to, we're going to ditch the floaties. We're in the pool every day. We're just going to teach him how to swim. And uh, by him watching his older sister and by him just being in the pool with his parents, um, he learned how to swim. We never taught him how to swim. He just learned how to swim. And one day I was doing a little, <laughs> I was doing laps in our little backyard pool just to try to get some exercise. And I was doing freestyle stroke. And this is about two weeks after we took the floaties off of our son. And I look behind me and my son is doing the freestyle stroke. Never once have I talked to him about it. And you can imagine had I uh, told him, okay, move your right arm here and then move your left arm there. He would have looked at me like, what on earth are you talking about? And he would have just ignored me and kept swimming. Right. And so at its most, I don't know, distilled down, refined down, I don't know example uh little kid three years old watching dad swim in the pool and all of a sudden he's doing freestyle without ever being taught how to do it <laughs> obviously it wasn't perfect but it was certainly uh you would know what stroke he was trying to do and so uh, demonstrations are incredibly powerful some of you may have seen this find it all right i don't know why just like that right in the old bucket good toss See, that's much better. That was good. You had your shoulder pointed, you kept your eyes on your target. Let's do it again, watch me. Just like that one. The durability of the Volkswagen facade. Pass down something he will be grateful for. Good. That's the power of German engineering. So, that was played during the Super Bowl a few years back and it's pretty accurate. Uh, our kids watch what we do. They watch what um, more high-level kids do, and they are pretty darn good at replicating the skills. And so uh, one thing you can that I like to say is give your kids a chance to do it right or do parts of it right before you fill their heads with a bunch of information. So give them the demo. Let them go do it. Identify the parts of the skill that they're doing well. Push those off to the side and focus on the parts that they, that they need work on and you're really simplifying and shortening the learning curve for everyone so demos are great but they're not everything they're not enough and so learners will attend to task irrelevant information so for example if you're in the gym and let's say you're a 25 year old young athletic uh, person who you know maybe had a collegiate playing career and now you're coaching and you can still jump you know 35, 40 inches, and you're a really good demoer. You go up, you take a swing, you bounce a ball. What do you think the athletes are watching? They're probably watching the ball, or they're watching what color so socks you have, or they're checking out your shorts, or whatever the case may be, but they're not paying attention to anything in particular unless there is a sp very specific task that you're trying to get them to focus on. And so learners will attend to task relevant information, and we have to remember that as we're going. So knowing that, we love keys. What keys, do, what keys do is they condense information. 
they reduce words, which is incredibly important. Uh, they increase attention of the athletes. Turns out that they uh, increase the attentions of coaches, which we need, and they enhance memory. And so the, I don't know, the communication between athlete and coach gets to be really, really simple and efficient when athlete understands the demands of the skill using keys and the coach understands the demands of the skill using keys. And so this becomes this really simple, um, sometimes not even in need of words. You can just, you know, put your wrists and hands together and the athlete knows what you want them to, to work on or do. And so incredibly efficient, incredibly simple. It also saves time because you're not having five to 10 minute conversations after every ball. You can give a key focus or get a focus, you know, onto a key and it's just very efficient. There's something called external versus internal focus. And this is reasonably new research. And I'm gonna post a, a blog post. It's a tennis blog post at the end of this. And I'm gonna let you read up on that on your own. We don't have time to dive into it entirely, but uh, it's pretty interesting stuff and it's changing how we wanna present some information um, to our athletes. And so I'll, I'll make sure to post that link. You guys can read read up on that. And I know Eric also is pretty up to speed on that research. So words have little meaning to beginners. So I'm sure we've all gone down or been in the trap of talking to a 14 year old or a 16 year old and they're, and you can tell that they're just staring at you and nothing you're saying matters to them. Nothing that you're saying is getting processed. And so that's not nor, that's not abnormal. I mean, it's not normal for a kid to be able to sit and listen to a coach talk to them for five minutes. They're just not going to listen. And so they're going to tune out. So demo the skill. This is a this is a uh, an order in which we like to present uh, a skill to an athlete. And so because words have little little meaning, we can demo the skill and we can pre-assess. By pre-assess, we say, go try it. And so if we're teaching spiking, we can have a someone demo the full skill. They're gonna have a full four-step approach. They're gonna jump up and they're gonna hit a live volleyball, hopefully, the full skill. And then you're gonna say, go try it. And if you do those two things with every skill, especially with beginners, you're gonna be shocked at, generally speaking, that the general ability that they're gonna have to perform the skill. Okay, it's not gonna be perfect. Uh, some will be better than others. But generally speaking, they will be able to jump up and hit a volleyball to some degree into the net, over the net, whatever the case may be. But uh, they'll be able to perform the skill to some to some level. Once we pre-assess and we give them an opportunity to try it without filling their heads, we can present them with one key. And so now we're going to demonstrate the skill with one key. And so I don't know, I'll use one universal key that you're probably familiar with. Um, the ball nose angles or face the ball and angle your platform. That's a key. And so we can present that key, the, the skill with that key, and we can go out and we can get to work with that key. And it's it's focused, it's simple, not a bunch of conversations happening. The athletes understand the demands of the skill and the communication is uh, consistent and efficient uh, between coach and athlete. Practice uh, feedback specific to key. So we just talked about that. And then we can move on. We can demo uh, the skill with the next key. And so we think that four to five keys is enough. And in an ideal world, if we get really good at those four to five keys, it takes care of so much other stuff that, we'll never gonna, that we're never gonna have to work with. It, it just fixes lots of little inefficiencies. And so, uh, I've seen our five passing keys when we really even our top the top three passing keys that we have when we really get good at those top three things it takes care of so many other things and we really and it really develops efficient simple passers uh, as a coach one of the traps is you're going to go out on the court and you're going to start noticing other things that your athletes might be doing so let's say we're working on our angle as a passer you might notice something else that you don't like that your athlete is doing. Um, we get distracted and then we start coaching that when we're trying to stay simple, we're trying not to overload the athlete, we're trying to stay focused on one key and one skill. And so as a coach, it's pretty important that we stay disciplined in knowing that we're, we're focused on one thing and we can always revisit some of these other um, inefficiencies 
when the time is right. So that's a big time trap that we need to be aware of and have some awareness of uh, as coaches. Loader programs, I'm not gonna get too into this just due to time, but um, when our athletes make changes, physical changes, um, they actually, their body actually changes and neuro, you know, pathways in their brain actually changes. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that, a little bit about that. And uh, we're gonna talk about general versus specific uh, abilities. And uh, we'll dive into that here. Skill development is essentially the brain changing as a result of practice to build connections between the trillions of neurons that are responsible for skilled movements. And so perhaps some of you have read uh, the talent code. There's a lot of great information there. Uh, and Daniel Coyle says skills are really just circuits, circuits in your brain. And so uh, when we're develop, develop, uh, developing new skills or making changes, we're developing uh, new circuits in our brains. And so general or specific, I'm not going to go through all these quotes, but I'm going to give you a, I don't know, we'll, we'll read the bottom one. Human beings have an amazing capacity to learn new skills and adapt to new environments. However, several obstacles remain to be overcome. The most notable impediment to this goal is that learning tends to be quite specific to the trained regimen and does not transfer to even qualitatively similar tasks. So I'm gonna dive into, whoops, this one here. Hitting a baseball is a visual motor skill that is about <clears throat> recognizing where baseball is going to be at a particular instant of time. And so the most common deal there is if you have kids that are in t-ball, uh, hitting a t-ball is a completely different skill than hitting a baseball that is moving from a pitcher. And it turns out that in some little league uh, leagues, uh, areas of the country, they're actually starting to uh, have a pitcher or a parent uh, stand off to the side and have the athletes hit a moving ball rather than a stationary ball. And so these trainings are highly specific and they're not general. And it's, I don't know, this is one of the hardest things for our uh, folks, the coaches that we work with the grass in that there's no, we like to say there's no such thing as general athletic ability and people kind of short circuit, they lose their minds. What are you talking about? And so you all know that athlete who is on the basketball team, on the volleyball team, on, you know, runs track and does everything she or he does, they're good at. And so it's, we like to say that they have all of this general athletic ability, but really what they have is lots and lots of specific abilities. And so the point here is that if we want to get good at volleyball, we've got to play lots of volleyball. And there's all of these little gimmicky things out there that can distract us and waste our time. You know, this is just kind of a silly little video here. <laughs> so, the title of that video is if speed ladders made us good football players or something to that effect. And so if you're going to spend all your time on speed ladders, you're going to get faster at speed ladders. You're not going to get faster at running a route, catching a football. Um, and I could go on and on about, you know, different examples, but if you want to get good at something, uh, the point being is those skills that you're trying to get good at are highly specific and we need to be as specific as we can uh, when developing our, our practice gyms, our drills, all that type of stuff. There's been a great deal of research. Uh, there's this idea of transfer. Um, when we do, let's, for example, uh, if we're hitting off a tee, if our, our kids are hitting um, baseball off of the tee, uh, is that going to transfer into the same skill of hitting a moving baseball? Or if I get to be really good at ice skating, well, that helped me be a good snow skier because it's kind of the same movement uh, type of thing. And it turns out the research tells us that this transfer is minimal, if anything. Uh, the transfer is very, very small when it comes to similar 
movements, similar sports transferring into other movements, other sports. Uh, the science is telling us that it's very small and not nearly as much as one might think. And so in 30 whole part studies reviewed, not one favorite teaching methods that use part or progressive instruction. And so whole versus part, what this means is if you're demonstrating a skill for your athletes, a whole demonstration would be you doing the, the full skill. I'm gonna take a four step approach, I'm gonna hit a volleyball off of a live set, and I'm gonna perform the entire skill. A part would be, I'm gonna break all, the, all of this down into 15 different parts, and I'm gonna teach them to you one at a time. And so again, there's very strong evidence, the research tells us that whole is much better, much more efficient, than part. And there's a pretty important question here that we have to ask ourselves, and it's does whole overload information processing, um, particularly in early learners? And I think the answer is yes. But the, I don't know, the curve, the learning curve is gonna be steeper, but it's gonna level out faster. And that athlete is gonna be, I don't know, get to from point A to point B faster, um, if we can kind of push through some of that uh, information overload early on while teaching the whole skill versus we're gonna break this down into 15 different components, which is also information overload and not as effective. And so you're front loading a little bit. It might be a little tougher on the front end, but you're gonna break through and, uh, and get to where you wanna be a little faster if we can teach the whole skill. Now, within that skill, if we're performing the full skill, we can focus on parts of the skill. So let's say we are working on spiking and I'm taking a four-step approach. Within that movement, within the whole skill, four-step approach, I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna swing and spike at the set. I can focus on my arm work. I can focus on my footwork, but we're still performing the entire skill. And so um, that's a pretty important part of what we're trying to do here. Block versus random. I'm gonna give you an entire presentation on blocked versus random practice at the end of this. It's in a PDF format. I'm also gonna give you a link of an entire presentation that we have um, about random versus blocked. But for those of you that may be new coaches, uh, random versus blocked is, random would be six on six volleyball. We're playing random six on six volleyball where it's not planned out, it's not recursed. Blocked activity is where we make the, the, the activity or the drill is a little more predictable. For example, standing on a box, hitting at a, a defender off of a box, or maybe you have one of those spike it deals that holds the volleyball and your athletes can jump up and hit the ball out of the spike it, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, that's random versus blocked practice. The research here also tells us that random is better. However, we don't think this is black black and white. We think this is there's some middle ground here uh, where we can, uh, I don't know, put together some really effective drills that are kind of tweeners. They're a little bit random, they're a little bit blocked, and it can help our athletes uh, increase the rate of learning. But you'll have a better understanding of that once you read through the presentation that I'm gonna provide for you uh, once we're done here. Progression should be limited in number. And so, we talked about keys and we think four to five keys is about right. I have heard of programs, collegiate programs having 15 passing keys or 20 passing keys and it's just too much um, for athletes and for coaches to, to wrap their heads around. And so uh, if you are gonna have progressions, keys, uh, five, four, I don't know, is a, is a good number and, uh, and just keep that in mind in terms of keeping things simple, keeping, th keeping things focused. Here is something we found on YouTube. It's a little bit extreme in terms of like, I don't know, it's kind of silly, but when we talk about progressions,
Okay, that goes on and on. But you can see all that text at the beginning of that. And then the kids are they're talking about spines and back angles and all of this stuff. And I can assure you that none of your kids care about back angles. Uh, and you can see as they go through the progression, they're going through hula hoops and that's getting their back to a certain angle and uh, and all of this stuff. They're not touching any volleyballs and uh, and this stuff happens. It's it's going on in our gym and it's going around, going on in gyms all around the world. And so um, this, this is why we want to be simple. We want to be focused. We want to be specific. And we want to touch the volleyball as much as we can. Drills. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of drills, but anything less than a game situation, unless very well planned, has the possibility of introducing artificial situations and complete transfer to the game situation might not occur. And so when drills are developed, the teacher should carefully consider the way the skills are performed in a game to determine that the drills are as close to the game as possible. And so I want to give you a, one example here. We'll talk about the box since it's next. If you stand on a box, and these are for professional athletes um, down in Brazil, if you stand on a box, you are predicting, it becomes predictable. And there is a time and a place for this. Um, you can, it can be effective for learners, uh, teaching them how to move, uh, getting them, you know, dialed in with the skills. But we want to graduate from this as early as we can. Uh, and so what we like to say is teach your athletes to move, teach them the right moves, the fundamentals, and get them out of that and into game-like situations as quickly as you possibly can. Now, if you're spending too much time on these boxes, what you're ultimately doing is you're creating a false sense of confidence, both with you as a coach and with your athletes, because it's a very predictable activity. And then all of a sudden, you're, you're in this predictable activity where the coach is hitting 10, 15 balls at you, you know, that you're digging. And then all of a sudden you go uh, into real life volleyball and everything's different. You got to see the set, the, uh, the hitter's approach, the hitter's arm swing. Uh, there's all of this stuff. There's a block in front of you. And so it is an entirely different skill to dig a ball behind a block in live six on six volleyball than it is to dig a ball that is virtually the same ball hit at you over and over again. So it's orchestrated. It looks good. It looks organized. And it can be good for teaching the skills early on, but it's not where we want to live. Uh, maybe it's a few minutes here and there, and we're going to get off the box as soon as we can. So we don't want to, I don't know, I've been on a box plenty, and, and most of us probably have. There's a time and a place, but just know that the transfer from box to real life volleyball isn't just going to magically happen. It's going to take a lot more game-like reps and feedback for that to actually occur, for those changes and upgrades to actually occur where it matters, and that's in the match. One of the most important things that we can do in our practices is to ensure that we get lots of reps. Not just reps, uh, blocked reps, but the right kind of reps. And so <clears throat> we go around and we work with club coaches and high school programs all over the country. And the amount of gyms that have 20 to 30 minute, 40 minute warm ups during a club season when you only have four hours a week, um, it's happening all over the place. And so think about the number of reps that you can have in your gym with your athletes if you design really, really great warmups that inv involve volleyballs and involve volleyball movements and involve you know, dynamic blocking moves, dynamic uh, transition footwork patterns, overhead digging. There's all of these things that you can do to warm up with a volleyball or with volleyball moves that is going to triple the rate of reps and we, you know circling back to the two percent rule if your practices are more efficient from from minute number one then an opponent who may even have more talent than you have but you're getting better reps and working on the right things you're going to start chipping away and you're going to start beating those teams and so just remember your four hours of practice or however many hours of practice you have every week is so critical, the type of reps we get and the number of reps we get is one of the most important things to do. Feedback. I mentioned earlier, one of the traps that we have to deal with 
as coaches is we become drill runners. Uh, we, we become drill runners, especially if we're running new drills every day because we're focused on how to run the drill. Uh, is the drill going well? Maybe it's not going well. Um, do I really understand how to run the drill? Uh, versus just giving lots and lots of really, really good, simple feedback throughout the drill. So again, let's not be drill runners, let's be teachers. And if I circle back to my coach in college, who is Carl McGowan, uh, he was relentless at teaching during real life, game life, six on six volleyball. That's where he operated. He was so good in that phase. And so often when we're in a blocked activity, maybe we're on a box, that's the example that everyone likes to use. Uh, it's easier for us to coach because everything's, it's, it's all scripted out than it is to run a drill and see what we want to see in a game-like situation or stay focused on the things that we want to stay focused on in a game-like situation and still coach and give feedback. And so just remember that we got to coach during these game-like situations. It's not a time to just sit back and be a drill runner or an observer. Um, I'm not going to cover these. There's just different types of feedback, you know, direct. Um, if you have questions about this, you know, let Eric know and we can elaborate, but um, you know, direct, we're just going to tell you exactly what it is. Question, <clears throat> this is a really effective way to give feedback. Um, you know, what did you feel on that move? Uh, something like that. Video, of course, is great. Watching a model and then a positive, catching them do it right, catching them do it right. That's, that's a really powerful deal there. If you're trying to make a breakthrough with an athlete, they do it right, especially in a game-like situation in practice. That's We want to celebrate those moments, but we're not going to cover uh, feedback styles too much in this presentation here. So how can we increase reps? We know that they're incredibly important. We know that your time is limited. And we're going to, I don't know, this is an unpopular slide. And essentially what we're saying is that stretching is a waste of your time. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reviewed 361 research studies on stretching. Uh, the results published in the March 2004 issue of Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise concluded there was no evidence that stretching before or after exercise prevents injury or muscle soreness. So, coach, for uh, the Connecticut women, basketball you guys know him gino here's what he says stretching before practice is the biggest waste of time in the history of sports yet he gives his players 10 minutes to stretch so that they can all sit around and talk about what movie they saw what pair of shoes they saw i stay in my office until they're done it's nauseating so <laughs> it's just kind of a silly quote but they have at the university of connecticut more time than you have and so that time where they can sit around for 10 minutes and stretch is probably not something that you can afford to do in club volleyball. Maybe in high school volleyball, you, you have more time, but in club volleyball, you got to get going. And so there's some ways that we can warm up without sitting on the ground and stretching uh, with volleyball specific moves that are highly effective. And so I, I mentioned some of them earlier, we can work on a four step approach without a ball. We can work on transition footwork. We can do blocking trips. We can work on our blocking footwork. Um, and so there's all these pre-practice activities that we can do that are volleyball specific, that are still warming us up, um, not risking injury. And uh, we can kind of ease into practice, but we're getting better at volleyball while doing so. Tutoring, uh, coach player ratio. So this is just, you know, if, hey, if you have the gym for 10 minutes, before your practice starts for whatever reason, and you can get a setter in there and it's just you and the setter getting a few reps, even if it's 10, 20 reps, um, that's really valuable time. Small group activities. So most of you have probably played queen of the court, stuff like that, doghouse, Neville's pepper. These are small groups. So three on three where we're waving through and that increases the number of touches that each athlete gets when they're on the court. Rather than having 12 athletes on the court, we've got six or eight athletes on the court and smaller number of athletes equals more reps. Uh, multiple entries after a serve. And so we have lots of drills where there's gonna be a serve. And then depending on what happens with that ball, the coach is gonna enter a second ball. So for example, if I'm on the receiving side and I win that rally, perhaps I get a second ball entry. And if you 
I don't know, I, I, if you're not doing this, I encourage you to reach out to us after this presentation and get an understanding of, of exactly what it is we're talking about. But basically, um, you're increasing reps four times with it, over the course of a practice by doing second ball entries, um, as opposed to when you're playing six on six volleyball, just serving back and forth, because your athletes are gonna miss, they're gonna kick the ball, they're gonna, you know, bounce it on the ground five times and in between each serve it's going to take four minutes five minutes and when you have multiple entries after <clears throat> a serve we're getting depending on the activity two three four balls within um you know two to three to four extra balls for every serve that happens so it's a faster pace activity with way more reps and <clears throat> if you have questions or you want an example uh, of that let us know and we'll provide that for you guys Whiteboards. If you don't have a whiteboard, um, it, it's silly. We, we say whiteboards change your life. Uh, that's a little dramatic, but it's true. And uh, I don't know how to coach volleyball without a whiteboard anymore. And so if you uh, learn how to put your practice on a whiteboard, there's all of these kind of small little benefits that come out of it. First, you're organized as a coach and you can go be a good teacher rather than a drill runner. So you got it all up there. You're ready to go. Everything's right there in front of you. You can go focus on teaching and learning. Next, your athletes are all going to come to the board before practice and they're going to check out what's going on. It gives you an opportunity to give them a high five, say hi to them, check in with them. And they like to see the drills. They like to see who's their, who, their, who their teammates are going to be. And it just provides this really good deal. And then also a lot of you might be coaching in practice by yourself from time to time. If you're coaching by yourself, your athletes can help you keep score. They can tally up on the whiteboard. If you have an injured athlete or someone from JV that wants to hang out in practice, it's a really, really easy way to keep score of your drills um, when, when you're under, you know, when, you only, when you're by yourself or it's just you and your assistant. Your athletes, you know, can even get to know your drills, get to know how they're scored. They can keep you in line in terms of scoring so you can focus on teaching uh, within those drills. So if you don't have a whiteboard, even if, you know, if you're on a low, um, if you're on a tough budget uh, at your high school, even a little small whiteboard uh, is better than no whiteboard. Ideally, we like the four by six or four by eight whiteboards that are on wheels that you can roll around the court, um, two-sided. Uh, it's just a really, really great way to organize practice. And I think if you do it and you start doing it, you'll never go back. It's an amazing tool to have in your gym. So that's a crash course in motor learning. And Eric, I'm going to uh, post a few resources here. For those of you that are with us, this, I'm going to post this link down in the message <clears throat> area. Can everyone? Eric, can you get that out to everyone? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, I should be able to. Are you going to put it in handouts or chat, or where are you going to put it? I've got it in chat, but I can put it wherever you want me to put it. No, no, let's put it put it in the chat. That sounds good. So okay, just so there, there this you is go. A blog, this is a blog post about external versus internal. It's um, There's some tennis examples that are really simple, kind of easy to understand. It's a very um, introductory article that I've found uh, explains things pretty clearly. This next link coming through is a full presentation on blocked versus random training. And it's really good. It's one of my favorite presentations. I think it's incredibly helpful uh, and it really breaks down how you can design your practices, uh, your drills. Um, it breaks down the pros of random versus blocked. And uh, it's just a really, really practical, less academic, uh, presentation that you can you can go into your gym right away and start implementing some of the ideas here. Um, lastly, I'm going to give you one more URL. On this page, you have access to a virtual coaches clinic that we did during the quarantine back in spring, and it has a bunch of uh, live sessions here that you can reference. Specifically, the new live session added 
um, new motor learning ideas. There's a guy in this presentation, Andrew Strick, and he's uh, he lays things out in a really simple way as it relates to some of the, the new motor learning research. And, uh, and so I would encourage you to listen to that one. Uh, it's about 45 minutes to an hour. You can, it's on demand, so you can listen to it whenever you want. Um, but in summary, I think there's a few things that are really, really important. And, and if you're a new coach, this may have been information overload. We may have been violating all of our own rules, but uh, if we could just distill things down, it would be that as coaches, we tend to over, over communicate with our athletes. We tend to talk too much. Uh, it's great if we could give them an opportunity to perform the skill after a great demonstration before we start filling their heads with a bunch of information. Uh, after that, let's get some really, really good keys in place that will simplify communication, streamline communications, and ensure that your athletes understand the demands of the skill uh, and your coaching staff understands the demands of skill, the skill. So everyone in your gym is going to be using the same terminology, um, just highly efficient uh, way to teach and to learn. In terms of some of the motor learning stuff, um, just understand that all sports, volleyball is incredibly specific. Uh, all sports are incredibly specific. Skills are incredibly specific. And so uh, if we have limited time in the gym, which we all do, how are we going to spend that time? And uh, we want to touch as many volleyballs as we can, play as much volleyball as we can. We want to design drills that are, um, I don't know, that are adhering to principles and the laws of learning. Um, and to some of the science that um, that we know is is there and can back us up. And so if you do that, I think you'll find that those little uh, small gains, 1% here, 2% there, uh, will start to appear. And ultimately, uh, what I believe truly, what we've seen happen over and over and over again is if you're a less talented volleyball program or volleyball team and you have to go up against teams that are a little bit better than you or a little bit more talented or have maybe have a tradition of more success than than where you're currently at if you chip away at it with great principles and with great methods and really efficient um, teaching and really efficient training blocks you will start to catch up you may never fully catch up but you may start to catch up and before you know it you're going to find yourself in a five game match with that team with a chance to win it. And uh, and I think that's all you can ask for. That's what you want is to start knocking on the door a little bit. And so um, some of these some of these ideas hopefully will will get you going in that direction. And uh, if you have any questions, Eric knows where to find me. And uh, and lastly, I live here in Arizona. Um, we run camps during the summer. And uh, if you'd like us to come out and get some of this stuff integrated in your gym, we'd love to love to work with you. And uh, again, Eric can put you in touch. So thank you for having me. It's always, like I said, a, an honor to get a chat volley. And uh, hopefully this was valuable for you guys. So thanks. Got a couple of quick questions, Mike. But yep. first of all, I got two or three people that are asking me. So on your control panel for GoToWebinar, uh, the, you will see uh, questions and a couple of, of uh, shots down, you will see chat. And if you go into chat and scroll down, Mike has posted the three things that he just talked about. So those of you that are asking where the links are, go to chat, pull it down and scroll down and you will see, it'll say Mike Wall, organizers only. Oh shoot, you know what Mike, I think you just sent it to us, that's why. I just oh, looked yeah. at organizers only. That's okay, everybody, uh, you see my email addresses uh, up there? Uh, feel free to just email me and I've gotten I've got all three of them locked down and I'm happy to send them to you it's not a problem so uh, Mike Holly says when designing practice how much would you train offense versus defense when trying to achieve that two percent spread between you and the opponent yeah great question and that that comes down to you know what skills of the game are going to give you the most bang for your buck right if we're if we're in have limited time how are we going to get the most bang for our buck it turns out that in women's volleyball the most important skill skills are related to passing and spiking and we all know that serving and passing is you know 
is important. So of course we can just kind of factor, you know, or assume that we're always going to get those lots and lots of those reps. But generally speaking, uh, offense is going to yield a uh, better bang for your buck than defense. Uh, I shouldn't say defense than blocking um, in women's volleyball. And so that's a whole nother presentation of, of team systems, but just as a generic answer, you're going to want to really dial in serving and passing. You can't spend enough time doing that. And you're going to want to spend quite a bit of time on, um, you know, teaching your young kids and if you're beginners or whoever to, you know, run an offense. And, uh, and then the other thing in women's volleyball is digging is incredibly important. Digging is more important than blocking. And, uh, and you're, you're just going to be in transition a ton. And so if you're um, kind of trying to create a practice, and I'm talking in generic terms here without knowing your team, but, you know, serving and passing is incredibly important. Transition play, incredibly important. Um, digging, uh, incredibly important. Not just digging, but digging to a place where we can run an offense and transition. Uh, those are going to be your big ticket items in women's volleyball. And if you're trying to build a program, or you have beginners or you have young kids, blocking is probably the last thing on the list in terms of actually having an impact on wins versus losses. Uh, second year coach here, this is from Suzette. Uh, could you name some multiple entry drills? I've seen some, but I'm drawing a blank at names players will recognize. Sure, um, I'll, try to, I'll try to give an example, uh, let's see. Wash table, that's as easy as any, right? Um, or transition wash, basically what a second ball is. Well, you know, let's just use queen of the court. We, we all know queen of the court. And we have a drill, it's called queen's bounce one or monarch bounce one. And the bounce one is a second ball entry. And so in queen of the court, uh, we, we know, most of us know, I can't assume we all know, but uh, most of us probably know that the receiving side, if you win, you remain on, you remain queens of that side of the court or, or kings or whoever you're coaching. Um, you stay over there as long as you're winning. With this particular format, if you win the serve, you're going to get a second ball from the coach. If you win that one, you still remain. And so you're basically going serve. Okay, we won and serve, receive. You get a second, you earned a second ball entry. And depending on, you know, that what happens with that ball, you either stay or you you go. Um, you could play six on six, a drill where let's use one, two, one. We have a drill called one, two, one. And what that is, is the receiving side. It's six on six. The receiving side, if they win the serve, they earn the right to get a second ball entry, a second ball from the coach. If they win that one, they earn the right to get another second ball, another uh, ball from the coach. So you win and serve receive, you get a ball from the coach. You win that ball, you get another ball from the coach. So that, that rep represents three volleyballs, a serve and two balls from the coach. If you win those three, you earn the right to serve for a big point. So you got to win four little points to get the big point. It's called golf scoring. Um, and I know this is probably, <clears throat> it's, it's kind of hard to explain without some graphics or videos, but, um, but that's, that's an example where if you win a rally, you earn a second ball entry. And the, and the beauty of second ball entries coming from coaches is they can be whatever you want them to be. And so we mentioned transition. In women's volleyball, 50% of your world is in transition, which means uh, the ball goes over the net and it comes back and we get another chance within the same rally. Um, your second ball entry can be, can mimic a transition type of play. Your second ball entry can challenge your setter to get off the net and, and set a, you know, set off that set a, a tough play or set, set a tough ball. Um, your second ball entry can be an overhead dig by your libero, you know, whatever you want to do, the, the, the list goes on. Um, and it really allows you to focus on deficiencies within your team and uh, it just speeds up your practice and gives you way more reps. Okay. And uh, finally, this was a one that was uh, sent to me. Can you describe what one of your gold medal camps, how it kind of goes, how, you know, time-wise days, 
you know, kind of how it's taught, that kind of thing. Can you just gonna give like a quick overview of what a, a gold medal camp would look like for a high school? Yeah, so we typically run those, we run them any time throughout the year, but most of them happen in the summer. Uh, obviously this year is all out of whack, but um, typically the camp starts on Monday morning and uh, we'll go, it's their full day camp. So they're 8.30 to five and uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, typically. Um, and what we do is we we go through all of the skills, we implement the keys that we just discussed in the motor learning activity or the motor learning presentation. And so we go through passing, serving, spiking, um, all of that stuff in the first day and a half, two days. And then we, we migrate into team systems, uh, we implement team systems. Um, and then, you know, the last day and a half, two days are a lot of competitive six on six activities, which allows us to transfer you know some of the the skills the fundamental skills that these kids are working on into real life volleyball which is at the end of the day um, where the rubber meets the road and so it's a comprehensive camp we cover um all skills we cover team systems and we get we get a lot of competitive play and and so uh, yeah we've had a lot of success it's a great way to get ready for the for the season the fall season and uh, it also gets your JV coaches, your frost coaches, you know, gets your entire program in the gym at the same time, which can, you know, be nice for uh, continuity uh, in terms of how we're going to teach the skills, um, but also just a ton of reps before your season starts. Okay. Um, uh, Suzette, I, I will have you, uh, she's got a, a question about cost and I will have her uh, contact you directly. Anybody that wants to sign up for the camps, Mike, or get more information, uh, goldmedalsquared.com. Yep, and you can feel free to give them my email. Okay, I'll do that as well. Uh, everybody, I on the, on the chat, I did put all of the links to the entire audience, so you should be able to find them on the chat now. But again, you can also email me, and I'm happy to send them to you uh, either tonight or tomorrow. Um, if there's no more questions, and I don't see there is, Mike, I, I want to thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge and your expertise with us. Um, and I hope the... Uh, the coaches got a lot out of it. I know I did. I always do. Um, and I appreciate your time. And uh, everybody, I'll leave uh, I'll leave the screen on for maybe another minute or two uh, so you can grab those links uh, and then I will sign out. But Mike, we appreciate it. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks, guys.